Good morning and welcome to All Saints Online Sunday Service. I am so delighted to have you join us this morning, wherever you are tuning from. I pray that this service will bring you uh, nourishment spiritually and perhaps uh, physically in many ways. This morning I will be joined by um, Pauline who will be preaching and Jim will lead us into our intercessory prayers. The next four weeks, four Sundays, we will be looking at the theme of giving. Now, when we talk of giving, of course, your mind goes to financial giving. Yes, we do need the finances to continue to sustain uh, the work that we are already doing within All Saints Church, but also giving in terms of your time. So all those together, again, during the service, um, Pauline will explain more about a particular passage that we'll be looking at in Luke. So join me as we worship together. Shall we pray to start this meeting this morning? In our meeting together, let us remember that we worship the God who created this world, the God who spoke through his prophets from generation to generation led his people from captivity to liberty, healed the sick, fed the hungry, and was faithful even when faced with rejection. The same God who wants all people to be drawn to his love and grace, to know his forgiveness and the joy of his salvation. So friends, let us put aside all that hinders us and together in worship and praise. Amen. So friends, if you're able, could you join me in singing this song in whatever format you want, Here For You, We Are Here For You by Matt Redman.
And so as we continue with our worship, let's reflect by saying the words of confession. Father God, you are the one who leads us from darkness into light, from captivity into freedom, from anxiety into peace, from despair into joy. Yet we long to break free, choosing independence, convinced of our own wisdom, forgetting your love and grace. Forgive us. Draw us close to yourself. Embrace us once again in your loving arms and enable us to follow you in worship and grateful service each day of our lives. Amen. And so let's continue to sing another song, Great Are You, Lord. He's a great God. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out. It's your breath, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out.
Bible reading. Our Bible reading this morning is taken from the Gospel according to Luke from chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. And here it reads. And the ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witnesses. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus looked at him with sadness, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can, say, who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or wife, or brothers, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time, and in the age to come, eternal life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And now let's watch a video clip from Bible Project since we are looking at the theme of giving. Then we will listen to a song about a rich young ruler by Stuart Townsend, Keith and Christine, followed by the sermon and then prayer led by Jim. Imagine your friend invites you to a party. You arrive and there's lots of people, decorations, food and drink. There's enough for everyone. When you're hosted by someone that generous, you don't have to worry about your needs. You can just enjoy yourself and focus on the people around you. Yeah, that's what a good host wants for her guests. And this is the picture of the world that we find in the Bible. Creation is an expression of God's generous love. He's the host and humans are his guests in a world of opportunity and abundance. And we're called to keep the party going, to spread his goodness. This is a beautiful picture, but it's not the way people experience the world. Rather, we find a world of scarcity and struggle, not abundance. And Jesus grew up in that kind of world. Under military occupation, people losing their land or families to debt and poverty. And yet, he would say things like this. Look at the birds. They don't store up food for themselves, yet they have enough. Or consider the wildflowers. They're beautiful and abundant, and they don't stress about their existence. And you all should live that way, too. But surely Jesus knew that things don't always work out. I mean, sometimes there really isn't enough. And Jesus did experience poverty firsthand, but he viewed the world through the story of the Hebrew scriptures, which claimed that our scarcity problem isn't caused by a lack of resources. Rather, the problem is our mindset that God can't be trusted. Maybe God's holding out on me. Maybe there isn't enough, and maybe I need to take matters into my own hands. And once we're deceived into that mindset of scarcity, we can justify the impulse to take care of me and mine before anyone else. And that leads to envy, and anger, violence, and a world where it seems like there's not enough. The party's over, it's turned into a battleground. But God wants humans to experience his generosity, and so he chooses one people, the family of Abraham, and he promises to give them the abundance that he wants for everybody else. God will provide what they need, 
All they have to do is trust his generosity. And through them, the whole world will see how generous the host really is. But that's not what happens. Abraham's descendants, the Israelites, enter a land of abundance, and they promptly forget the host who gave it to them. They act like it's all theirs, and like there's not enough. And it leads to war and Israel's self-destruction. If I were the host of this party, I think I'd just give up. But God doesn't give up. What he does is surprising. He gives another gift. Another gift? Yeah, but this gift is different. What God gives is himself. All right, and Jesus, the host himself, comes to join in on the spoiled party. And notice, Jesus lives with the conviction that there is enough and that our generous host can be trusted. His mindset of abundance allowed him to live sacrificially and generously even towards his enemies. And Jesus called his followers to trust in God's abundance like him. And that's why he said things like, sell your possessions and give to the poor, or don't worry about your life. He's inviting us to live by a different story, one that is built on trust in God's goodness and love. But living generously doesn't mean life is gonna go well. I mean, look at Jesus. He was betrayed by his friends and he suffered. And this was no surprise to Jesus. He knew that people would take advantage of his generosity. In fact, that was his plan. Really? Yeah, think about it. Jesus knows that we're all hopelessly deceived by this lie that there's not enough. Yeah, that lie needs to be defeated. And so that's what Jesus was doing when he gave us the gift of his life. Jesus' death was the ultimate expression of God's generous love. Yeah, God's love can turn death into life. And scarcity back into abundance. Or as the Apostle Paul put it, you know the gift of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, that even though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And Jesus called his followers to live like the real party has begun. Yes, he called it the kingdom of God. And our invitation to this party is yet another gift, the personal presence of God's own spirit that can teach us how to trust the generosity of the host, just like Jesus did. Yeah, and when you believe there's enough, you start seeing opportunities for generosity everywhere with our time and money, our attention. Yes, one of the most important ways that we can experience the abundance of God's new creation is sharing with others because of our trust that God is the generous host. Teacher, will you tell me what must I do for eternal life? I've kept your laws completely. Sell all you have, give to the poor. Then heaven's treasure shall be yours. How hard for those who are rich on earth to gain the wealth.
compensation. To bestow, to give a birthday present to someone, to hand on to someone. Interestingly, the subject of each text are all based on personal encounters with Jesus in his ministry and cover a wide range of people. Today we're looking at the rich young ruler, next week the rich fool, although this one's a parable. Nevertheless, Jesus knew his listeners would be familiar with the landowning gentry of the day. And then the Zacchaeus. And then finally, the widow, without a name, but who gave her all. Jesus was able to discern the thoughts of each and every one he met. And each and every one of us is known to him. In other words, he knows what makes us tick. Lives were changed through encounters with Jesus. The, these are just a few of the encounters Jesus had as he journeyed around. He changes lives and still does today. The passage we've read tells us of a meeting with a young man who craved spiritual fulfilment, but found the cost far too great to bear. This was an opportunity for him to enter God's kingdom, but to do so would mean he would have to have a radical change of life. Let's have a look at his profile. We pick up the story in Luke's account. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The word which is translated from the Greek ruler, Archeum, is generally one who has administrative authority, a leader, an official, and it's used for various Jewish leaders, including those in charge of a synagogue and members of the Sanhedrin. So in other words, he had a lot of responsibility and was well respected. Matthew's account adds another detail and refers to the ruler as a young man. A relatively young man, a youth, a young man, usually meaning from about 24 to maybe 40. He had an abundance of earthly possessions. He was a man of great wealth, Luke tells us. The adjective great translates Greek sphrodra, a very high point on a scale of extent, very much, extremely, greatly. So we get the impression of this amazing young man, maybe in his 30s, we don't know, but obviously dressed to kill. And maybe people would have separated themselves from him as he came up to Jesus. He was earnest, he was wealthy, and probably because of his wealth and earnestness, he wanted to be spiritually fulfilled. This would go along with the fact that he was a, a spiritual advisor, natural to be a leader a, a, in the synagogue, a ruler and a respected person in the community. Well, if he came along today, he might have been dressed in a suit made by Gucci. So he came in his fine robes, which would have been the Gucci of the day, and he was immaculately groomed. And there he is, kneeling in the dirt of the roadside at the edge of town. But he had a burning question to ask Jesus. The young man 
kept all the commandments, but still senses a lack, a, an incompleteness. Or else he wouldn't have come to Jesus in the first place. Now Jesus speaks to the young man's point of need. Let's read again what it says. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Jesus affirms the young man's sense of need. The word translated lack is greet and it means to be efficient in something that ought to be present for whatever reason, a lack. But Jesus, Jesus' prescription is unpalatable to the young man and probably to us. Sell everything and give the proceeds to the poor. The word translated give in Greek means a portion among various parties. Distribute, give. If the man does this, Jesus assures him he will have treasure in heaven. That which is stored up for him. It is an ironic exchange that Jesus proposes. Exchanging fabulous wealth here on earth for fabulous wealth in the kingdom of God. It's interesting that many in history have tried to buy their way into God's good graces. Many of the world's beautiful cathedrals, we've got two of them up there, Temples and mosques are inscribed with the names of generous benefactors. If you go to the cathedral today, you'll see lots and lots of names of people who gave to the Anglican Cathedral to have it built. But Jesus is not proposing buying anything or doing anything glorious. He isn't proposing a massive contribution to the Jesus Christ Evangelistic Association that will spread the gospel in perpetuity. Jesus proposes that a man sell all his property and give the proceeds to those who are least able to give back, the poor. St James is right when he characterises this true religion. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and we could add refugees and asylum seekers, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You'll find that in James 1 verse 27. And we go on to see how money corrupts. The truth is that money in itself has a way of polluting us tempting us to compromise our values in order to gain and retain it. For the love of money, says Timothy, is a root of all kinds of evil. That's the love of money, not money itself. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So he had an experience of that in his ministry. Recently, Jesus has taught his disciples about the importance of faithfulness with regard to money. And he says in Luke, a couple of chapters earlier from the passage that we read, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now his disciple, disciples have an object lesson to learn from. An actual rich man. He's fabulously wealthy. Can he? Will he? Will he become a disciple? Money, however, isn't the only thing that Jesus asked the young man to give up. Possessions. What money will buy? The accoutrements of wealth. A new car? A nice house? A membership of a country club? Fashionable clothing? There's also status and influence. People make way for the wealthy, hoping some of that wealth might rub on them, off on them. At the very least, people kowtow to the wealthy to keep from becoming their enemies. There's power. Wealth is power. It buys influence. One is tempted to think of Donald Trump. It buys others who will now let the wealthy have their own way. Community leadership. The man isn't very likely to continue as a respected ruler without his wealth. If he gives up his wealth, 
he will be misunderstood and resented by the other influential people in his community. No, he won't be a ruler for long. And what about family? The young man probably comes from a very wealthy family, but if he gets rid of a huge chunk of the family wealth, will his siblings understand and accept it? Will his wife and family, his father or mother, if they're still living? How often have you been tempted to do things that were wrong or unethical or self-serving because of the law of getting money? Even, even a little bit of money. Money must be either controlled or it will control us. It's a sad thing when our possessions begin to possess us. So he became very sad. But this radical call to discipleship is too much for the rich young ruler. Verse 23 of our passage. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. The word translated sad in Greek means very sad, deeply, deeply grieved. Matthew and Mark note that a man went away sorrowful. Jesus remains standing where he is on the verge of continuing his journey. But the earnest and rich young ruler, his faith, face stricken with grief. The man's face fell, it says in Mark. Rises from his knees out of the dust. He averts his eyes from Jesus, turns slowly and moves away from the band of disciples. He cannot go with them. He cannot go with Jesus as much as he would love to because he loves one thing more and he cannot leave that to serve God. In a very real sense, he has broken the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Nor can he obey the Shema, which, as a devout Jew, he recites twice a day. And the verse from Deuteronomy says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your strength. Jesus has indeed pierced that man's soul and has proved to him and those who are listening to the conversation that you cannot serve God and money. Either he will hate the one or love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. It's true and for the young man he knows it is sadly true. There is more. Jesus comments on the rarity, the impossibility of the rich or anyone being saved. A look at verse 25 emphasises this. Indeed, it says in verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus' analogy of the camel and the eye of the needle probably has nothing to do with the small gate in Jerusalem but could be a pun on the similarity of the Greek word for camel, which is camelos, and that for a heavy rope, which is camelos, spelt slightly differently. The deliberately observed image simply emphasises the, the impossibility of the rich being saved without divine help. This applies to the poor as well, as well of course. It applies to all of us who can be saved. The promise of such divine help is spelt out in the scriptures. For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible, we read from the passage. This keeps the passage, and hopefully us, from descending into a simple cynicism towards the rich. In other words, because people are rich, they're automatically outside the kingdom of God. But the challenge for disciples remains. We may not be wealthy, but there is something we possess or that possesses us that we are willing to give up to follow Jesus. He must have your all. And he calls gently to you, come, follow me. So what does the study of this passage have to do with our theme of giving? Well, first of all, Jesus knows us all intimately and if we stood before him today he would see our inward secrets and desires. It's an uncomfortable position to be in. We are all surrounded by possessions which we hang on to and in modern parlance we'd say we all carry baggage. 
we need to give up all we have to God, all the gifts he has so generously allowed us to enjoy, not just money, but hospitality, time, talents, all of which we should dedicate to God our Lord and Master. He has given us them to us, we give them back to him and use them in his service. What a great asset that earnest young man would have been to Jesus and the ministry. Freed from the bonds of possessions and status, Jesus could see that potential and yet he allowed him to go away. We're not pressured to give, but it is our free choice to do it in love as a grace gift to our Lord. And thinking of the generosity of God, we're going to have a look at a verse in Malachi. Bring the full amount of your tithes, gifts, to the temple, so that will be a plenty of food there. Put me to the test, says the Lord, and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you in abundance all kinds of good things. I will not let insects destroy your crops, and your grapevines will be loaded with grapes. Then the people of all nations will call you happy, because your land would be a good place to live. An amazing verse. In giving back to God, we re retain or give or have been given more than we have given. Press down abundantly. Giving is the one thing God tells us to do, to test him in. In the New Testament, God himself gave us his only son because he loves us so much. And that son died on a cross for us. It sets a model that generosity in God's people should be sacrificial. I'm going to end with a prayer. Dear Father, Jesus' words have a, word, a way of piercing our hearts and defensive, the defensive we've built up against you and doing things your way. Make us tender-hearted. Gently expose the reservations of our hearts as you did for that wealthy young man many years ago but give us grace to be able to obey you. The great physician, who alone can heal our corrupt and deceitful hearts and make us whole. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for clinging to the remnants of life independent of you and make us wholly yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. And let us thank God for his goodness. Bless and guide our clergy, Mike, Bob and Helen, as they preach and lead and direct the work of our church. Keep them safe from coronavirus and guide them as to the best way out of the Covid restrictions. We pray that we who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless and guide Elizabeth, our Queen, the Prime Minister and his advisers, as we come out of this pandemic. We pray for a more generous attitude to poorer countries in the distribution of vaccines. We pray for safety for those left behind in Afghanistan, both British citizens and Afghans who served with the Allies. Give good success to those negotiating for an orderly withdrawal out of the country. Direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, bless and encourage our mission partners serving you overseas. We remember Mike and Sylvia Brown and their two boys, Kevin and Chris and the work of translating the Old Testament into the Toba language. We remember Dr Shirley Haywood and her colleague Dr Shu Vechaha as the fistula surgery picks up and as they continue to care for Covid patients. We remember Reverend Alex Opio leading the work of Adusi Parish in northern Uganda. 
and also Ed and Mary Bryce working with their church in Northern Argentina. Give our mission partners the joy of seeing people coming into a new relationship with your son Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, we remember poor people in the countries where there's war, famine and coronavirus. Bring them the help they need and encourage the aid agencies as they bring that aid. Guide the leaders of the nations to bring about a fairer world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all who suffer in body, mind or spirit. We remember particularly any known to us. A moment of silence for you listening at home to bring to mind anyone you are concerned about. Heavenly Father, give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. We close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Pauline, and thank you, Jim, for being part of this worship this morning. And now it's our time for notices. Just to say that uh, morning prayers are still continuing every Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. Please do join us wherever you can. This afternoon, um, we will have Bob Corrin's memorial service at 2 p.m. And the same service will be live streamed and the link can be found in the church WhatsApp group. And if you struggle to access it, please do get in touch with one of us, Mike, Helen, or me. And our birthdays. Happy birthday to you, Jim, and happy birthday to Liz. I hope that you have had a good birthday experience celebrating with your loved ones and with us all from church joining in. Happy birthday. May the good Lord continue to bless you, protect you, and encourage you in all that you do. Happy birthday to both of you, church. And thank you for all that you do at All Saints Church. Happy birthday. And now we come to the final part of our service, which is the final blessings. Shall we pray? May your troubles be less and your blessings be more and nothing but happiness come through your door. So, brethren, wherever you are, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you always and evermore. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. And now, the final song. Praise is rising, hearts are yearning for you. Shall we sing together and may good Lord be with you.
When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Away. Cause when we see 